Okay. So today we want to look at behavioral economics. And let's take a look at what this chapter goes over. We're going to start by looking at some of the origins of behavioral economics. And it's strange that behavioral economics started with psychology. And so we're going to turn right away to look at the brain and how the brain affects our economic behavior. Now, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I don't know very much about psychology. I've studied psychology as it relates to economics. But today, the, the, the big thrust in this area is on taking findings from other fields from neurology, there's now a field of neuroeconomics, taking fields and, and looking how this is applied not only to economics, but also to finance. And this is fascinating. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about this and some of the stuff I've read on it. And then I wanna look at some, uh, some recent findings. You know, recent means the last 20 years and talk about their implications. And I want to point out the difference now between traditional and sometimes referred to as neoclassical economics. And this is economics developed in the uh, oh, 1880s until about 1920. Uh, and look at some of their findings and those of behavioral economics and how they compare. Okay? so. Let's get started. Let's go back and, and, and <clears throat> look at a couple of things that we covered in, in chapter one and three and all the way into chapter, um, uh, the recent chapter, chapter seven, which is a very important chapter uh, on uh, utility. Now, neoclassical or traditional economics believes that our decisions are rational but we started finding out that through different evidence that people make systematic errors in their decision-making. Now, it's important to hear this word systematic. People make mistakes all the time. But systematic means these are regular kinds of errors that are based upon certain kinds of characteristics in all people. Neoclassical or traditional economics could not explain this, what was going on. A new field called behavioral economics arose to explain these kinds of errors in our in thinking and behavior. So let me review just a couple key ideas in the older traditional economics. Now remember, this is not, uh, uh, invalidated by the findings of behavioral economics. Instead, these things work together. This is just the growth. And I'm predicting that as different sciences like psychology, biology, economics, as they continue to find out more things, they're gonna become more interconnected and Many of the findings are gonna work with each other. Okay, so traditional economics was based on certain assumptions about how people behaved. Now these weren't proved that nothing, these were just, oh, we think people behave this way. And if they do, then A, B, and C follow. Traditional economics was tremendously logical. And that was, so attractive to me when I first started. I thought it was great because you could just figure out going from one to two to three to four and it all made sense, especially microeconomics. But these assumptions were questioned. One assumption, for example, is that people have stable preferences that aren't affected by context the situation that are people in. No, it, it does affect, we found. 
Traditional economics believe that people are eager and accurate calculating machines. <laughs> we know that's not, that's pretty yeah, obvious. Right? People are terrible at math and they don't like to do it. <laughs> Traditional economics assume now, these are assuming people are good planners who possess plenty of willpower. Well, that's almost laughable. Yeah. People are terrible planners and they got no willpower at all almost. Someone just, wait, what? What the heck? Someone just said toilet paper in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> and it assumes this. This is something that, that uh, when, when I was studying economics, I believed this, that people are almost entirely selfish. They're looking out for number one. And the assumption was that if everybody did this, if everybody out there was selfish and looked out for themselves, the whole society would benefit. That's a, a, one of the basis of traditional capitalistic thinking and the rise of alternative ways of thinking such as communism or socialism, You're attacking that idea. And this was a belief of capitalism in the traditional sense. Now, Psychologists, not economists, psychologists found that these assumptions were highly unrealistic. They didn't think real people behave this way. <clears throat> these psychologists and some economists who started agreeing uh, started the field of behavioral economics. And it's interesting, these psychologists knew zero about economics, zero. They knew less than my beginning students. They knew nothing about it. Some economists though started finding out what these guys were saying about human behavior and started applying it. The emphasis of this, this group of people back in the, in the 80s was focusing on the middle process behind decisions seeing what, what really was going on mentally when people made decisions and then improving outcomes by improving decision-making. Okay, one of the leading researchers who founded behavioral economics was the, the leading psychologist of the day. He's not an, an economist. He wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. His name is Daniel Kahneman. Hey. Daniel Kahneman, a psychologist, won the Nobel Prize in economics. Now, in the last 20 years, maybe five of the Nobel Prizes in economics have gone to behavioral economists. But Kahneman, he knew very, very little. In fact, he had to, to grab some economists to try to explain to him <laughs> what economics is all about. What he was looking at was how people made decisions. Okay. It's a good book, by the way. It's, it's not an easy book, but it's a terrific book. So Kahneman's finding about the brain and decision-making. Now, for a long time before Kahneman, uh, psychologists had known that the brain is modular, which meant that specific areas of the brain dealt with specific sensations like vision, breathing, and anger. And, you know, they would do things like put electrodes in one part of the brain and they, they could stimulate your vision or ang make you angry, things like that. So we knew that the brain was modular. <clears throat> Kahneman was looking at decision-making process. And he found that the brain had two parts to its decision-making process, which he called system one and system two. Now this isn't covered too much in your, in your text, but I think it's important to understand this if you wanna understand behavioral economics. System one now is the older parts of the brain. They were, they, they've been able to figure out what part of the human brain developed first and what part developed second. System one is the oldest part of the brain and it was developed 
to enable human beings to survive by using a lot of shortcuts. You think back now, the, the, the uh, prehistoric humans, they had to be very, very cunning and quick. They didn't have a lot of natural things to defend themselves with. They weren't particularly fast running. They weren't good climbers. They didn't have a lot of uh, physical weapons that, that they could use to survive. So they had to be really quick or else they were gonna be meal for a predator. And to survive then, they developed these shortcuts of thinking that all of a sudden they, ah, they see something out there, whoop, danger, I better get the hell out of here. System two is the result of millions of years of evolution. In system two now, they use the newer parts of the brain to undertake slow, deliberate, conscious calculations of cost and benefits. Okay, cost and benefit analysis. Okay, which is the, the cornerstone of traditional economics. But Kahneman said this, here's an illustration that he would use. 95% of your brain is system one. System one based upon intuition and instinct, not thinking. It's unconscious. It's super fast. It's associative, means that you combine symbols and images and it's on automatic pilot. System two is rational thinking, not comprised according to Kahneman and other psychologists, 5% of your thinking. It takes effort. It's slow. It's logical. It's lazy. People don't like to think. And it's indecisive. Well, if it was decisive, we never would have survived because it's slow. Your unconscious intuition and instinct are quick. It's gonna get you out of danger. The rational bit, hmm, let me analyze if that lion is gonna charge or not. Let me think about this. Well, you're gonna be dinner for the lion. Okay. System one, has very little understanding of logic and statistics and frequently makes mistakes in judgment about these things. System one encourages to be overconfident in what we know and fails to acknowledge the full extent of our ignorance of the world as, role, as well as the role of chance events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is an important statement here. There's a big one. We're overconfident. We think we know more than we know, according to system one. We don't acknowledge the full extent of our ignorance. And we don't acknowledge the extent of chance. System one, our instinct, we like to see patterns. We're great at seeing patterns. Chance is not, a, not in there. The important feature is you can't turn off system one. It's always going. System two is normally in a comfortable, low effort mode. Your daily life. System two is just going along, just cruising. And only a fraction of its capacity is engaged. Only a fraction, right now, only a fraction of your mind, of, of your brain rather, is being engaged. Only a fraction. Right, so I, I actually had a question about the two of these systems. Of the what? Uh, I actually had a question about the two of the systems. So yeah. 
system one, you wouldn't actually let you, you said you like necessarily wouldn't have control of it. It's on autopilot. You said it is. Yeah. And so system two, um, like it said in the last slide was like only, what was it? 5% of your brain. Was yeah. what it said. Right. And that would be, let's say putting in effort to kind of learn new things or kind of apply logic to it. Is that what it is? Yes. Okay. That makes thinking. sense. Thinking. That's well, what we would call thinking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 5%. And we, we're not even using very much capacity of that 5%. Yeah. Why? Because it takes work. Yeah, it it's does. It's slow. And we're lazy. Yeah. So this is a survival kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Imagine if those two systems were reversed. 95% uh, no, <laughs> no. of us would be using that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now. Most of what you think, and here's some more findings. Most of what you think and do originates in your system one. But system two takes over when things get difficult. The problem is it's slow. And it's lazy. System two is lazy. Mm -hmm. I keep bringing that up, man. Okay. Now. The division of labor here, according to Kahneman, is highly efficient. In other words, it minimizes effort and optimizes performance. If you sit around just thinking about what you're going to be doing, you're not going to get anything done. The division here between these two systems is automatic and efficient. Now, here comes one of the big crux of behavioral economics. System one is prone to biases. And these are systematic errors made in specific circumstances. This is the insight that led to behavioral economics. Traditional economics believed that people were rational. They were thinking about things to when they made their decision. We have found though, that because system one is so dominant, people make mistakes, systematic mistakes. Okay, so here's a chart. Now this chart was taken out of your text. So I, I want you to go over that. If you understand the divisions here, that's going to really help you understand the chapter quite well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's take rationality. Now, rationality doesn't mean that a person is rational. What this means is that you're going to look out, you're going to make decisions based upon ideas. Okay. So neoclassical believe that people are fundamentally rational and will adjust their choices and behaviors to best achieve their goals. Consequently, they will not make systematic errors. Behavioral economics says people are irrational and make many errors that reduce their chances of achieving their goals. And these are regular, repeated, systematic errors. Stability of preferences. Neoclassical economics believe that people's preferences are completely stable and unaffected by context. Behavioralists have found that people's preferences are unstable and often inconsistent because they depend upon context. And in the chapter you call framing effects. Well, we already went over this when people are eager and aggard calculators according to neoclassical economics. Behavioralists say people are bad at math <laughs> and avoid difficult computations if possible. No way. Ability to assess the future. According to neoclassical thinking, people are good at assessing future options as current options. They're good at it. We found though that people place insufficient weight on future events and outcomes. They value the present, not the future. And they make mistakes of thinking about the future. Strength of willpower. Well, neoclassical economists said, no problem. We can resist temptation. We make rational decisions. Ah. 
<laughs> Behavior said, people lack sufficient willpower and often fall prey to temptation. You guys all know that's true. <laughs> you do, yeah. Degree of selfishness. According to traditional economics, people are almost entirely self-interested and self-centered. Behavioralists say, wait, people are often selfless and generous. In terms of fairness, is that important to you? Well, traditional economics said people don't care about fairness and only treat others well if in doing so will get them something they want. Behavioralists say, no, 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 no. Many people deeply care about fairness and will often give to others even so, even when it doesn't bring them personal benefits. Okay. Now, what are these implications of hardwired heuristics? Now, remember, a heuristic is a thinking shortcut. Okay? Hardwire means this is in your brain, in your older part of your brain. It's hardwired in there. Okay. <clears throat> these shortcuts are not the most accurate mental processing options, but are used because the opportunity cost of perfection is very high. You're giving up too much. So you, you rely upon these quick shortcuts or heuristic. <sighs> Here's a real problem. Since these heuristics or shortcuts are hardwired in our brains, it may be difficult for people to alter their behavior. It's hard for people to change. They don't change. It's really, really tough to get a person to change. And then people may be easy prey for those who understand their hardwired tendencies. Now, as a sidelight, many tech companies today such as Apple, Google, Amazon, have behavioral economic departments, which are focusing on understand how do real people behave in the real world? And you know what they're doing with that information. They're shaping their products, their sales pitch. They're doing everything. So last year I said, <clears throat> I'm working on a book, by the way, on, on behavioral finance. And uh, so last year I said, I'm going to go to uh, a training that was offered for uh, businesses in the Bay Area. And you go up there and for a weekend, two days of training. And companies like Google were sending teams in. The price was $15,000 a day per person. Wow. For two days, $30,000. I passed on it. I, I said, well, I'll read about it. <laughs> <laughs> But big companies now are heavy into this. And these companies are, are focusing on how do people behave so that we can sell them more stuff. Okay, let me give you four examples of some findings uh, and their implications, okay? Now the book goes over some more of these kind of cognitive, they're called cognitive biases and talks about them. Let me give you four and show you how these things work and, and the implications. Okay, number one, it's what's called the confirmation bias. And with the confirmation bias, people cherry pick facts that confirms to what they already believe and ignore everything else. So here, here's a model here developed by a psychologist, um, Jonathan Haidt, and <clears throat> If we have this circle here is objective facts. And this circle here is things which confirm your beliefs. So what people find is they ignore all the other facts out here. They pay attention to the facts which confirm their beliefs, ignoring everything else. So what are people doing? They're not using the scientific approach, which says, we're going to go out and try to find the truth. Instead, people go out 
try to find information that conforms to what they already think. Oops, let me go to the next one. Okay. The implications of this one, by the way, are not brought on your text, but this is tremendous for what's going on in modern America. The confirmation bias has contributed to divided society in America. With internet and cable TV now, we have scads of sources of information about the world. You can go on, on uh, cable TV and watch a conservative news program, a liberal news program, a quote, more objective program, and everything in between. On the internet, you can get information from the crazy lunatic fringe all the way to a scholarly journal. You can get all kinds of things. People pick out the things that confirms what they are ready to believe. They're not looking for the truth. They're looking, ah, okay, this confirms it. So a conservative will watch conservative TV, read conservative articles and newspapers. A liberal will watch liberal TV and so on. Now crazy, well, look at the crazy stuff out on the fringe. People don't change their mind. Very rough to change a person's mind, but rather become more convinced of what they already believe that's supposed to be true here. I don't know what the hell I did there, true. <laughs> okay, so this is something. That <laughs> okay, that's number one. That's a really a big one. Another one that I like is called the availability bias. And the availability bias is the tendency to overestimate the likelihood of events with greater availability and me memory. This means they events in memory now can be influenced by two things. One, how recent the memory is. So if something recently happened, you're more likely to remember it and think this is more likelihood of happening again rather than something happened in more distant past. Second, how unusual or emotionally charged the memory is. We tend to view vivid events as being more likely to happen. Now here, here's a, a, a concept that uh, I've talked to a lot of people about um, and that they've had similar experiences if they're a little bit older. When I was young, for example, uh, my, my way of life would, uh, as a kid, um, I'd leave the house in the morning and my parents would be, they'd say, well, come back, be back here for dinner. I was on my own the day. I went wherever my bicycle could take me. And sociologists have mapped this out and they, they're looking at, uh, they, they tracked people 30 years ago and see where they, they went during a day, young kids, and how far they went. And then they track people today. And today, children have far less expanse of where they're going. You know, well, what, what's going on here? Even the parents who grew up having free ran, they, I mean, I would go miles away. I just, you know, Sometimes me and my friends, we'd go backpacking in the local mountains by ourselves, you know, 11 years old, 12 years old. Very different. When I was uh, 11 years old, I got put on a bus in Memphis, Tennessee. And three days later, I got off in San Francisco all by myself. Amazing. What's happened? Well, we've been reporting more vivid kinds of you know, awful things that have happened to children. Not that there's more, but it's more vivid. And so parents have become more protective now of their children. Oh no, I'm not gonna let my uh, child walk to school. Uh, when I was growing up, nobody had their parents drive them to school. We walked ourselves, even via distance. Uh, Today, these kinds of vivid things, people are afraid more because of vivid things in the news and so forth. 
Uh, people think that crime, for example, is very high. The crime rate today for a serious crime, such as murder or rape or robbery, is dramatically lower than it was 20 years ago, which was lower than it was 30 years before that. Yet we, we don't react that way. Anyway, that's some implications of it. One, myopia. Now, <clears throat> we're not talking about eyesight here. Economists use the word myopia to describe the fact that a brain has a hard time conceptualizing the future. We don't make good decisions about the future. The primary consequence is that when people are faced to choose between something that will benefit benefits quickly and something that won't yield benefits for a long time, they have a very strong tendency to favor the more immediate option. Ah. The traditional economics thought people were very good planners. We are awful planners. We tend to respond to immediate gratification rather than looking at something that's going to take a longer time. And this leads to many, many self-control problems from people who overeat or use drugs or financially irresponsible and so forth. Okay. Four. And this one is, interests me because it went against something that I was taught when I was in college about fairness and self-interest. In the neoclassical models, it assumed that people were purely self-interested. But we've discovered now that human beings care about others in every type of economic behavior. Self-interest is there, but most people care about how they're interacting with others. A result, economic transactions are heavily influenced by moral and ethical factors, not just things that are going to benefit myself. And we can see this. Giving a charity, obeying the law, even when there's very little chance you're going to be uh, caught. Most Americans obey the law 99.99% .99 of the time. Purchasing fair trade products. Uh, we don't buy things that are, are made with child labor, for example. That's very typical. Okay, last word. Let's wind up with this, then Daniel can, can rest, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Behavioral economics does not replace or negate traditional economics. It complements it. Neoclassical economics can explain how the world works in many ways. Its theories and models, and you can't understate this, have enabled policies which have improved the lives of billions of people, billions around the world in the past 120 years. People have lived better, They've had longer lives. They've enjoyed life better. They've been healthier because many of the theories and models from traditional economics. But behavioral economists have only expanded economic theory by including findings about human behavior from other disciplines. And now they're starting to take some of the findings from traditional economics and put it into actual government and using a process called nudging. And nudging was by an economist, a behavioral economist named Richard Thayer, who also won the Nobel Prize and was, uh, uh, he worked with Daniel Kahneman. In the UK, they established a behavioral insight team and what they did was to study nudging people toward choices that are better for themselves and others. They nudged them by through certain kinds of policies for pay, paying taxes, about people attending adult literacy classes, increase their savings. And they did this by understanding how people really behaved and didn't come in and try to preach to them. They just, and they didn't force them. They didn't pass a, pass a law saying you have to do this they gently nudge by using certain kinds of incentives. President Obama 
used an executive order to implement many of the findings of behavioral economists. And he created, let me show you over here. Can you see that? That link in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is in September 15th, 2015. And he, he created an executive order using behavioral science to better serve the American people. Oh, wait, are, are you reading off of an article? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can't see the article. Okay. Uh, let me do this here. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, now we can see it. Yeah, I see it, okay. So here's the executive order using behavioral uh, science to better serve the American people. And it's from 2015. And <clears throat> I want you to go through and, and read this on your own. But what he's, what he's tried to do was to order all departments where possible now to look at how behavioral science can affect their area so that they can better serve uh, the public. And uh, so their goal is going to identify policy programs and operations where applying behavioral sciences may yield substantial improvement. Um, and of course, this was not followed in the, in the administration following uh, President Obama, but perhaps President uh, by, <clears throat> we'll bring it back. Okay, guys, that's a quick overview of uh, this concept. <clears throat>